Hello, this is video number three and it's about plasticity and functional recovery in the brain. Uh, this is a video for A-level psychology students, uh, principally following the AQA A-level 7182 um, in the second year of their A-level studies, but it'll also be, um, I think, interesting for any A-level psychology student um, or anyone interested in the brain. Plasticity and functional recovery. Well, what happens when you learn something? What happens inside your brain when you actually sit down and do your revision so that you've actually learned something permanently? Well, it turns out that when you learn something, and it could be learning uh, revision or it could be learning to juggle or ride a bicycle or anything like that, it turns out that quite often there is actually a physical change in the brain, a permanent physical change in the neurons and synapses of your brain. And that is plasticity. Plasticity is the brain's ability to adapt and to physically adjust itself as a result of experience and learning. And it turns out um, that uh, the cerebral cortex um, is actually like um, a muscle in this regard, in the sense that if you use it, it gets a lot stronger, and if you don't use it, it gets a lot weaker. Um, think about the part of the brain um, that controls the hands. Now, thinking back to video one, uh, we remember that um, the hands, and in fact the whole of the body, um, are controlled from the primary motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. And these are strips of brain that run just anterior to and just posterior to the central sulcus. And the primary motor area um, is in the frontal lobe, just in front of the central sulcus. Now, people um, who play the violin, they um, practice a very great deal with their left hand. They learn very complex um, and fast uh, motor patterns with their left hand. And it turns out that fMRI scans have shown that the part of the motor cortex in their right hemisphere that represents the left hand is actually enlarged with respect to normal people. They have a larger representation of their left hand in their right motor cortex. And that's not true for their right hands in the left hemisphere. So it shows that simply by practicing the violin for hours and hours and hours, what that part of the brain have done, has done is actually to get bigger and stronger. Also, people um, who are blind and who read Braille, they have an enlarged hand representation in the somatosensory cortex the part of the brain in the parietal lobe, just posterior to the central sulcus, that represents their hand. The part of the brain devoted to the afferent sensation from their fingertips, the part of the brain devoted to feeling the braille, is actually larger in their brains than it is in people who don't read braille. And that's because they have spent so long learning to read Braille and practicing reading Braille, that that part of their brain has actually physically enlarged, more so than in people who don't read Braille. And if you look at the brains of people who've been blind from birth, um, that is people who have never used their primary visual cortex, remember that's in the occipital lobe, right at the back of the brain, their visual cortex has never been used for seeing because they, they could never see and they've never seen in their lives. When these people read Braille, fMRI scans detect activity as they are reading Braille actually in the visual cortex, what in a normal person would be the visual cortex. And this shows that these people's brains have actually repurposed a part of the brain which is not being used for its normal function and made it do something else. So what is the brain actually doing um, when it learns something? 
when we learn a new skill, what is actually going on in there? Well, it turns out uh, that what's happening is the brain is adjusting the strength of the connections between its neurons. Remember that when one neuron joins onto another, that junction is called a synapse. When the axon of one neuron uh, links onto the dendrite of another neuron, uh, the, the, the gap between them is called a synapse. And the brain is quite good at adjusting the strength of those synapses. What the brain doesn't do is to grow new nerve cells. That doesn't really happen at all. What it does do, the brain, is to adjust the strength of synapses. And there are three um, ways that that can happen during plasticity. Number one is synaptic reweighting. Number two is creating new synapses. And number three is deleting existing synapses. And so I'm going to go through those three methods of plasticity one by one. Number one, synaptic reweighting. This is when you've got an existing synapse where the axon of one nerve cell uh, terminates on the dendrite of another nerve cell. And between the two, uh, there's a junction called a synapse. Remember, you get electrochemical transmission along the axon of a nerve cell, and then a neurotransmitter has chemical transmission as it diffuses across the synaptic cleft to the dendrite of the next nerve cell. Well, if a synapse is very active, then what can happen is it's, if it's active uh, over a long period of time, increased activity over a long period of time, then that synapse can actually get bigger, physically grow. And what that means is it will have more synaptic vesicles, which with each action potential will increase uh, will, will release more neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and so a stronger signal will be transmitted across the synaptic cleft and will be picked up by the dendrite of the next nerve cell. Equally, um, if those nerve cells are underactivated, if they're not activated so much, then the synapse can, can shrink and it physically gets smaller and you get fewer vesicles which means there's a less strong connection between uh, the two nerve cells. That's synaptic reweighting. It's synapses actually physically getting bigger and stronger or smaller and weaker depending upon their activity. And in that sense, they really are exactly like a muscle. If you use it more, it will get bigger and grow. If you don't use it, it will weaken and get smaller. The second means um, by which plasticity takes place is creating new synapses. And this can happen if the axon of one nerve cell passes really close to the dendrite of another nerve cell. If they are close to one another in the grey matter of the brain, then you can actually get a new synapse form between them, a synapse that wasn't there before. And obviously that's not growing a new nerve cell because the two nerve cells were there previously, but it is forming a new connection between two existing nerve cells. And the third form uh, by which plasticity can take place in the brain is by synaptic deletion. That is removing or deleting existing synapses. And this is sometimes called synaptic pruning. And it's actually thought that synaptic pruning is the main means by which learning takes place in the human brain. So as an adult, when we learn things, what we're actually doing is deleting lots of synapses which were there previously. And synaptic deletion is when a synapse actually stops working when um, the vesicles are physically reduced to such a number that the synapse actually stops transmitting uh, anything between the two nerve cells at all. So as we can see, learning in the brain is about adjusting the connections between the nerve cells in the form of synaptic reweighting.
Okay, so there's a key study here which is going to be really useful for us, and that is Maguire 2000, Eleanor Maguire. And what she did is to examine uh, the hippocampus of some London taxi drivers. She took 16 right-handed male London taxi drivers whose average age was 44 years and they had been um, driving London taxis for between one and a half years for the, the one um, who'd had the shortest tenure as a taxi driver up to 42 years for the one who'd been doing it the longest. She excluded from the study women and any left-handed taxi drivers just, just, just to keep it simple. And um, there was also a control group of non taxi drivers, same demographic, right-handed males, but they just didn't drive a taxi. That was the control group. And what she did is she gave all of these people an MRI scan and looked at their hippocampus. And the results were really clear. It turns out that the longer you've been a taxi driver, the larger your posterior hippocampus and the smaller your anterior hippocampus. And it looks as if being a taxi driver over the years changes the shape of your hippocampus. Remember, the hippocampus is to do with memory. We remember that from Clive Wearing, don't we? Because he didn't have a hippocampus and he can't remember anything. And when you're a London taxi driver, you have to use your memory an awful lot. What those people are doing is holding in their minds an enormous cognitive map of the whole of the A to Z of London, so that they can find their way from one street to another um, really, really quickly without having to look at the map. And uh, they have to learn an exam in order to become a taxi driver in the first place, and then as they're doing the job, they um, incorporate more and more and more and more knowledge about uh, the way uh, that the streets of London are laid out. And the longer they spend doing that, um, the more their posterior hippocampus grew and the smaller their anterior hippocampus got. And you can see that um, in these two graphs really, really clearly. This first graph, um, the x-axis, is the time uh, that each man has spent as a taxi driver in months and the y-axis is the volume of grey matter in this individual's posterior hippocampus and each point on the graph is an individual taxi driver and you can see there's a really clear positive correlation in this graph that for the individuals in the top right hand corner of this graph they've spent a long time as a taxi driver and they've got a much larger generally speaking, have got much larger posterior hippocampus and correspondingly the people in the bottom left of this graph have only been a taxi driver for a short time and their posterior hippocampus isn't so big. And in this graph, um, the x-axis is the same. It's the time that each individual has spent as a taxi driver. Once again, each point on this graph is an individual taxi driver, but this time the y-axis is the volume of grey matter in the anterior hippocampus. And you can see uh, that there's a really clear negative correlation. So what Maguire has found in this study is that plasticity is real. She has found that the longer you spend as a London taxi driver, um, the more your posterior hippocampus grows. And that the longer you spend learning that map of London, learning all of that knowledge of where the streets go, the larger your posterior hippocampus actually gets. And so we can see that the brain is changing itself through experience, that the grey matter, the synapses in the hippocampus are actually modifying themselves and getting more as a result of learning. Right, well in a moment uh, we're going to have a look at uh, functional recovery after trauma, but first it's time for this week's random psychology fact. Okay, um, this week's random psychology fact is, um, in some textbooks you'll see matching hypotheses attributed to Wolster 
and in other textbooks you'll see it attributing to Hatfield. Um, the reason is um, Hatfield is simply Elaine Walster's married name. Thank you. Okay, well that was this week's random psychology fact. Okay, functional recovery after trauma. Uh, this is another form um, of plasticity and it's about um, how the brain can recover its function after it's been injured. And we know about this because of localization of function. So, for example, um, after a brain injury but to a particular area, uh, then a person will often lose a particular ability. So, for example, if the person has a, a brain injury to Broca's area in the left hemisphere, then that's going to mean that they're going to have difficulty speaking following that brain injury because, of course, Broca's area is the part of the brain uh, that produces speech. Now, what can happen is over time that person can recover some of their ability to speak and the reason for that is because neighbouring parts of the brain are able to take over some of the function um, of the part of the brain that's being damaged. Now the important thing to realise to start with is that this is not because the brain grows back. Uh, once the brain has been injured, um, any brain injury is a permanent injury. The brain doesn't physically recover. But what it can do is that other parts, neighbouring parts of the brain, can learn to do the job that used to be done by the damaged area. And um, a good analogy for this is a hand injury. Um, supposing that you lose um, a couple of fingers on one hand, then those fingers are not going to grow back, no matter how long you wait. Um, however, what can happen um, is that the other remaining fingers can get a bit more dexterous and a bit more clever, and they can take over um, a lot of the work uh, that was done by the fingers which have been lost. And it's thought that this is how um, the brain deals with brain trauma and brain injury. So there are three main ways um, that the brain can recover its function following trauma. And those are neuronal unmasking, axonal sprouting, and the recruitment of homologous areas. So I'm going to go through those one by one. First of all, neuronal unmasking. This is when dormant synapses come to life. Synapses which were there all along, junctions between nerve cells, where the axon of one nerve cell meets the dendrite of another one. Synapses that were there all along, but have never been activated before. Well, following a brain injury to a neighboring area, this part of the brain can become more active. And some of these synapses actually start working. They were there anatomically, but not functionally. And because of neuronal unmasking, they can become activated and the brain can exhibit plasticity in this way. Secondly is axonal sprouting. And this is something uh, which only usually happens in the brains of unborn children and of very, very young babies. And that is when the axons of nerve cells actually physically grow longer. They sprout out, like twigs growing on a tree. And when they do that, of course, they can link onto the dendrites of other nerve cells and form new synapses. Now, under normal circumstances, the axons in an adult brain don't grow at all. However, following trauma, it's thought that neighboring areas can do limited axonal sprouting. It's important to realize that what's happening here is not the growth of new nerve cells, it is existing nerve cells growing longer axons. And the third way um, that um, the brain can recover following injury is in the recruitment of homologous areas. And this is when, for example, if you've had a brain injury um, on one side of the brain, for example, in Broca's, uh, Broca's uh, um, area in the left hemisphere, um, then the corresponding part of the brain in the right hemisphere can take over that function. So someone who had a brain injury and could no longer speak because of 
um, an injury to Broca's area might, a year later, be able to speak a little bit better because the corresponding area in the opposite side of their brain has taken over some of that work. Now then, all of these forms of plasticity do take place in the adult brain. However, children's brains are much, much better at this kind of thing than adults' brains. Children's brains are much more plastic than adults' brains. And that's because all of these different forms of synaptic reweighting and axonal sprouting and so on are much better and quicker and easier in a brain which is still growing uh, rather than a brain which has reached its adult uh, form of development. And that's illustrated uh, by two things. Firstly, how quickly and how well and how completely children can recover from brain injuries, whereas adult recovery is often much slower and less complete. And also, secondly, the sheer speed with which children are able to learn new material. Think about the speed and the efficiency with which a child learns languages. So much quicker and easier than an adult. And that's because the child's brain is so much quicker and better at forming all of these new neuronal connections than an adult's brain would be. So, if you are going to have a serious brain injury, then for heaven's sake, make sure that you have it when you're as young as possible. Okay, this video has been about plasticity and it's been about functional recovery after trauma and we have looked at three methods of plasticity. We have looked at synaptic reweighting, creating new synapses and we've looked at removing or deleting other synapses which is called synaptic pruning. And in functional recovery, after trauma, we've looked at neuronal unmasking, which is a form of synaptic reweighting. And we've looked at axonal sprouting and the recruitment of homologous areas. Is that right? Because she's so brilliant. <laughs> well, no, we were saying, she was like, I think what's the woman? And I was like, I don't think most is a woman. I was like, I don't know if I can know the women. I was like, Hatfield, uh, Elaine Hatfield's a woman. She was like, oh, I think Walster's name's Elaine as well. So we Googled it, and it's Elaine Walster became Elaine Hatfield. Really? And she was married. Because it was confusing, because sometimes you see Hatfield for matching hypothesis, but it's just it's the same person. Mm -hmm. It's a good fact. That is a good it's really fact, good. yeah. Check this nothing out here that shouldn't be out. <laughs> 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 okay, so when do I start? In your own time. What is it when you recorded? <laughs> <laughs> you should do the outtakes on them. Yeah. <la